actually, I was born in New York City, but when I was maybe in kindergarten or first grade, my parents and uh, sister and I, we all moved to New Jersey, northern New Jersey, and actually we lived in Radburn, New Jersey. And Radburn actually has some architectural historic uh, interest because it was the first planned community in the United States oh. by, designed by Wright and Stein. And it wow. it was at least 100 years ago that it started. And it was uh, using green belts and uh, cul-de-sacs. So uh, all of, so everybody kind of lived on this intersection of parks and bicycle paths. And it was a great place for a kid to grow up actually. So that that's where I really spent my time. And, um, but what, and then we had a summer house in Monroe, New York, which is further North upstate New York. And um, I really early on observed uh, that I used to like to build things and I would build forts and tree houses and <laughs> lean tos and and it just kept growing and i had this desire to build things i guess early on as a kid yeah and um at the age of 12 um i uh i designed for my science fair project a solar home so i really <laughs> and and by the way back then in 1958 that's when i was 12 nobody was talking about solar homes it yeah. was i the the most research that I could get done was actually from a magazine called Popular Mechanics. <laughs> Not nothing in architectural mm -hmm. books or magazines, really. And um, that that was a fun project. It won a New Jersey State Science Fair project, and um, it it just showed this continuing interest early on in architecture. And around that time, my dad, who was an inventor and an engineer, mm -hmm. uh, gave me a book on Frank Lloyd Wright and. Uh, I just couldn't stop turning the pages over and over again. I was just so uh, mesmerized and inspired by by what I saw. So I kind of knew that I wanted to be an architect from an early age and um, still want to be an architect. <laughs> That's, good. That's good to know. Um, I have to ask, so where did that idea for a solar home come from? Do you remember? I mean, this is a while ago, obviously, but I mean, that's a... As you pointed out, also during that time, it's not; it wasn't a popular thing. Like now, it's a very well-known approach to. I don't really know where it came from. I just it have was, no recollection of that. Yeah, it was inside of you. It's amazing. Yeah, it was inside. There you go. <laughs> so, architecture from a pretty early age, and then you end up doing a bachelor of architecture, right? Uh, also in New York, I believe. Yes. In, okay, so I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which is in Troy, New York, upstate New York. And um, I received a Bachelor of Architecture, also a Bachelor of Science, but a Bachelor of Architecture. And uh, in 1969, I was interested in studying with Louis Kahn, who was like, mm. to me, you know, the most important architect still alive and practicing and teaching in the U.S. at that time. And um, but I, 1969, the Vietnam War was raging. And uh, I was about to be drafted into the war. They would not let me continue to go to school. And um, really, but there was a major turn of events for me in that I was able to join the Peace Corps. So I did service in the Peace Corps and I actually uh, was able to work as an architect, which was really special. And um, I, they had just started an architecture program in Morocco. And when I had heard that I was uh, going to be assigned to Morocco, I got very excited because I thought I would meet Princess Grace, which shows you how much I know about Morocco at that time, or how much I knew. Uh, anyway, uh, it, so I was basically the first architect placed by the Peace Corps in Marrakesh to work for the Moroccan government's urban planning and <laughs> architecture department. That's so random. And, and it was, you know, mind boggling. It was amazing. I, I um, spent two years there and 
made many friends. Uh, I learned two languages, French and Arabic. Oh. Uh, and uh, traveled a lot in North Africa, really absorbing uh, so much the wisdom of the indigenous builders in the different climates and the coastal plains to the mountains to the desert. And it was really just an enriching experience all the way. So do you, do you want me to just continue yeah. on this story? Well, let, me, let me ask a quick question. So sure. um, joining the Peace Corps, like how did that transition happen? Were you, because I thought being drafted, like you couldn't be drafted if you were a student. Had you had you graduated? I had graduated oh, I see. Uh, from, I had a Bachelor of Architecture. I had graduated. And in 1969 was the first year that they did not allow you to go to graduate school without without um, being drafted at that oh. time. Wow. So it was all very specific. All yeah. of this was, you know, I mean, I'm a victim of my own circumstances. And, and um, but it turned out to be, you know, a, a path I wouldn't have imagined. And yeah. now I couldn't imagine having not done it. So, yeah. I was going to say you were in uh, Africa for six years and you served in the Peace Corps for two. That's, six years is a long time to be somewhere else. I mean, that's a... That's a it's a chunk of life. It is. It, and I was, you know, I was in my 20s. I was learning so much. I was absorbing so much. I was a real explorer in the sense that I was, you know, really learning about other cultures and and how it all ties in, as well as architecture. I mean, I was mm -hmm. really observe. I, I think I was a good observer, quite frankly. Um, so after that, uh, I then took a year and crossed the Sahara. I went in, over to Tunisia and then across the Sahara wow. into, um, into, uh, West Africa. And I did everything. And there's a French expression, bon marché, very inexpensively. <laughs> and, um, and I, I did that. I had a backpack. I never paid for lodging. Uh, and I was, you know, a, a, a real traveler and I, I teamed up with some friends and one friend in particular, uh, Diana Leone, a, a woman from California. Uh, we teamed up as a kind of travel <laughs> uh, posse, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we were very compatible and we had a great, great adventure together and went to just about every country in West Africa for a, and took a whole year to do it. Oh, so goodness. that was super exciting. Um, and then I went, back to the US for a couple of years after having been away a total of three years mm -hmm. and then went and then returned to Nigeria to be a professor of architecture at Amadou Bella University in Northern Nigeria. So all in all, that's six years in Africa. And uh, yeah, it's just a, a marvelous uh, experience to have lived through, uh, I have to say. I'm curious, what were some of the, I mean, are there, I'm, I'm sure, plenty of cultural differences uh, between Africa and the places you visited and lived in versus uh, New York or the United States. Um, but what were some of those, but also architectural differences? Because, you know, you went to uh, work at the Peace Corps as an, uh, in the Peace Corps, and you practiced as an architect there, and you taught architecture. I'm curious how different the architecture scene is in those countries as opposed to the United States. I mean, was it totally... Uh, how different was it? Well, I don't even know if the word scene would apply. Sure. Architecture scene over there. It's, you know, the architecture is there. It's just there. It all, it's, it's not about style. It's not about look at this or, you know, or am I different? It's all about the most gracious and simplest response to the climate, to the environment, and mm -hmm. to the materials at hand. So it's all very fundamental. It's, mm. it's just truly, um, it is, you get the most from the least in a way. And, uh, and that, that, that left a, a, a very lasting impression on me because, and, and it also uh, showed that you know, there isn't the same application that one should have, like a, a, a structure or a building in a cold northern climate would not be like a building in a, in a, in a hot, humid climate, for mm -hmm. example. And because 
that's never the way indigenous or the vernacular builder would do it. They, they, they are responding clearly, succinctly, and intelligently to, to, the, to their issues. And that was a very big learning experience. Um, I, I, maybe it's a good time to just mention um, that. Uh, so I have a lot of archives in that six year period. Uh, I took 6,000 slides actual slide <laughs> film <laughs> actual slides yeah. actual slides yeah. and uh but i documented um how do i say it i documented uh architecture uh culture decoration uh many aspects of the culture and uh, and I did a number of sketches and have sketchbooks and field notes. And I did some design projects. I designed a, a mud theater, or I should say a, a, a theater for uh, for a for Amadou Bella University, which, believe it or not, is still exists today, which <laughs> blows my mind. Anyway, all of my African documentation and designs and ideas are actually going to the Getty Center. So I'm very excited oh, about really? that. Oh, very yeah. cool. Yeah, they want it in their archives. That's amazing. Very cool. Yeah, it's exciting. You know, you were talking about the architecture being fundamental um, because it, it, it needs to be and it makes sense and et cetera. Is that different from, from what you had studied, um, you know, in the States or what you had seen going on in the United States? Because, uh, some, you know, I think it, the schools here, we love our theory. <laughs> yeah, no, actually, I mean, I, I had a very solid education um, and I was uh, inspired and nurtured by the masters, Le Corbusier. Mm. Uh, I had already mentioned Louis Kahn, uh, you know, Mies van der Rohe, I mean, Alvar Aalto. These, these, these masters all influenced... Um, me and uh and the rigor of how they would design as well i would say living in africa just gave me another nuanced way of observing and and after many years of absorbing it mm -hmm. observing absorbing and working there it it has um you know has affected my design work as well yeah. Was mm -hmm. it was it weird and and hard to come back from Africa to the U.S. and looking at the buildings <laughs> here? Like, did <laughs> yeah. you feel like the cultural shock in like the other uh, way around? Okay, so that's that's a good question. So, um, in the late seventies, I had already been there for six years, mm -hmm. and I, <laughs> how do I put this? I was kind of a big fish in a little pond and I was getting kind of comfortable, but I realized that I didn't quite have my own voice. I mean, my students heard my voice because I was always telling them be contemporary architects, look for new solutions, explore and, but don't lose sight of your heritage and the, and, and, and the wisdom of, of the vernacular of your own, of your own culture. Um, anyway, I literally on my 30th birthday, I still remember this in my brain, a switch flipped and I said, okay, I've been taking and taking and taking for all these years in terms of taking the generosity of their culture, taking the friendship of the people there taking uh information about food and culture and architecture and it was time to give back so hmm. the switch was flipped i visited my sister who works in the movie business and lived in la and i had uh, really been an east coast person and when i visited her the light bulb went on and i said you know i can continue with my indoor outdoor architectural explorations in los angeles uh, I can, um, I, I just felt the energy of this melting pot of a city of many different cultures and ethnicities coming together. I loved the rawness of it. So I moved to LA in 77 and, uh, 
all my East Coast tapes had been erased by living in Africa for six years, and I never looked back. And, mm-hmm. and I worked for a couple of years for an architect in Malibu. Uh, his name was Mike Barsacchini. And then um, I, you know, I got licensed and put the shingle outside my garage door where I worked <laughs> and inside the garage, <laughs> that is. And, uh, you know, it evolved from there. I think it's very interesting that you you can look back and, and understand your period of time in Africa and elsewhere as being in absorptive time, and that at some point you felt like, uh, I've been taking in, now I need to reverse it and give back in some way. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's interesting for me, because I think there's a parallel in how I felt about different places I've lived in uh, for a period of time, actually also around seven years, the same thing. Um, oh, wow. uh, we were on the East Coast in, in this case, but it was like, okay, mm-hmm. I've kind of taken enough of this place, this culture, whatever, and now I need to, there's, there's a, I always feel like there's a difference between comprehending and bringing in things versus putting out things. And mm-hmm. I think it's interesting you think of it that way. You're happy to be on the West Coast, I gather. <laughs> yeah. The weather is much nicer here. <laughs> it's a stupid thing to say because it's obvious, but man, it makes a big difference. <laughs> well, it makes a big difference. And, you know, if you look at architectural potential, it makes a big difference. Yes. And and I think the, you know, one of the things that I, and, and now I'm looking sort of uh, as an overall uh, observation, I think that, uh, you know, the West Coast and let's say California in particular, it has kind of, uh, it embraces new ideas, people that are somewhat adventurous. I mean, not across the board, of course, Mm -hmm. but there is that aspect. Uh, We're less bound by tradition. And I have found many uh, special clients that not only houses, uh, you know, public buildings as well, that, um, that really you, you know, as an architect, we we depend on the people who believe in us to yeah. to commission us for the projects that we design. So I found a fertile ground in Los Angeles. So this is sort of jumping forward in a sense, but I know that you guys have had a satellite office in San Francisco for some time now, and it's yep. growing a little bit. Is that the case? Or still yeah, there? it's growing slightly. I right. mean, we have five five people up there. Um, it's it's a it's a really good. Uh, branch office for us. It's uh, it's being headed up by Bryn Garrett, one of our young, very, very talented architects, youngish, very talented <laughs> architects. And and my business partner, Takashi and I mm. goes up there quite a bit uh, to, you know, spearhead the, the, the efforts. But we, yeah, we, we really feel that Northern California has a lot of potential potential for us. And we're doing a number of houses, some artist lofts. We have been working, we had worked on a project at Stanford. So it's, it's a, it's a good place for us to have an office. It's interesting. So, uh, one of the things we're always thinking about, because we talk about cities pretty often is the differences between those two places or Northern California, California versus Southern California more broadly. And you had mentioned that you found in Los Angeles, you know, there's a population, the population is receptive to new things, they're receptive to open to right. trying new things. And uh, we've always wondered, is San Francisco, is Northern California as open as SoCal? Is it difficult to find people who are willing to do experimental things? Well, you know, that, that's a good question. I think maybe San Franciscans are a, a bit more rooted in in the history of the city and it's very urban and dense but i have to say some of the uh urban multifamily <laughs> housing projects in san francisco that have been going up for the last 20 years mm-hmm. and, and 20 years plus are very innovative very impressive yeah and it certainly seems like multifamily is that's the future of san francisco 100 I, I think it's the future sort of in every dense mm-hmm. uh place in the united states and probably all over really i mean yeah. it, it makes sense because it's a it's a more sustainable um energy less consumptive of energy system yeah yeah jumping a bit back then so you started your office and you started as a single family residential practice i assume you started yes. on your own Yep, I started on my own. Actually, my very first project in California was I designed a house up in the hills uh, outside of Santa Cruz in in a little town called Scotts Valley. Mm -hmm. And um, 
it was a modest 1600 square foot house, very, very handcrafted. And actually, um, I, since I had, I designed it and I needed work and I told my friend Howard Swan, who was my friend and client <laughs> for, for, it was his house <laughs> that I would build it for him if he wanted. He said, great. So I moved a trailer up to the site and I became, I guess you would call me the construction manager. And oh, li wait, literally build it. Yes. Well, well I mean, I, well, I, you hired I helped, people. Yeah, of course. I too. hired real people. That <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, and I, and I, and I did swing the hammer and all of that. And, uh, it was, you know, it took about a year. It was great experience. And, uh, it's, it also gives me a, an appreciation of what the craftsmen do yeah. to, to make these projects come to reality. So it, it gave me a very firsthand sense of that. And, Anyway, that was my first project. Then I, the, and and I was sort of every other weekend I would I would come back to L.A. Uh, but uh, when I was done, I I kind of was really an expert at closet remodels, and bathroom <laughs> remodels, and you name it, I remodeled it, you know, and it was tedious, but I got through it. I started building up a little bit of a, of a momentum. And, um, and I had a, I, then I had a real breakthrough where, um, my clients, the Calfuses wanted to build a studio, a painting and photography studio, hmm. uh, right adjacent to a little Richard Neutra house that they owned in the Hollywood Hills on Astral Drive. And I designed um, a very pure, simple, uh, cubic composition of stucco and steel and glass, mm. and you know, really exploring how light comes in for the art for for art and photography for which it was a studio for. And uh, when it was completed, I um, I contacted Julia Schulman. To, to see if he was interested in photographing it. And um, he got excited about it after I showed it to him because he was very tired and anti uh, the postmodernist movement. <laughs> and this was not that at all. Uh -huh. And so he, he wanted to photograph it. He was already, um, you know, I was in my early 30s and he would have been in his early 70s at that time. And he, I mean, I don't think he came out of retirement, but he got excited and did it. And he, um, he took these beautiful photos, especially the black and white photos. Mm -hmm. They're just sublime. And he said, I'm going to help launch your career. And I go, great. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please do. And, and you know what he did? It was be within six months, it was on the cover of the New York Times home section of the wow. newspaper. And that did get a lot of attention. And then it was in Arc Record. And it, it just, I don't know, it just captured people's imagination. And, um, you know, in a way, I, I had not, since I had been in Africa for six years, I was not really very concerned with, um, Mo you know, architectural movements of the moment, right. like postmodernism. So I was just going to the beat of my own drum right. and, and it resonated at that time. Interesting. So that, that's a, you mentioned it was a painter's studio, like it was a small project. Yes. A painting and photography studio, a small 1300 square feet, the total wow. project. Yeah. Very, very modest, but, uh, it, it was seminal in, in the, in the, uh, hmm in <laughs> the evolution of my career. Right. I do have to say just uh, complete uh, transparency. I was also lucky that the clients hired me and the client was my sister and brother-in-law. So that, that, <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't hurt. <laughs> <That's> all, <yeah. laughs> that didn't hurt. But, but it, does, uh, it does allow me to talk about something that is interesting because you know, I was, so then I started doing more houses and I started getting a reputation and it was great. And I was teaching at the time too. I was teaching at USC. Oh. And um, actually I, I did the rounds in the early eighties. I taught at UC, uh, USC, <laughs> UCLA and SciArc, all wow. three of them over a period of about two or three years. 
but this is way before computers and cell phones and it was just really very very demanding and difficult to to do to multitask at that time yeah. so i in the end um couldn't continue to be as as involved in teaching although i continue to do it from time to time mm -hmm. but um anyway my point that i wanted to make was that so i had become kind of i was building up a, a residential portfolio and reputation for residential architecture and i really wanted to do projects that had a, a public um presence that could be engaged in by the public i had gotten a taste of that by working on the amadou bello university theater where 500 people could come on theater night and just have a special time all together which is not something that happens at a house so i was determined to try to branch out so i but it's very hard for a fledgling architect to get a public project mm -hmm. if you haven't done one before right mm -hmm. and i have to say that it's much harder today than it was back 40 years ago uh because today they want you know the, in in the uh in the submittal it says show us in the last five years the last three libraries you've done or whatever <laughs> it is you know and if yeah. you're <laughs> How do you do but, that if you don't ever get the first one? <laughs> uh, it's just, a catch twenty two. Yeah. It really yeah. is. So so anyway, but I was very interested in trying to work for the Department of Parks and Recreation uh, in the for the city of Los Angeles. They were building recreation centers for the city, but you know, uh, ten thousand foot buildings, usually a gymnasium, some community rooms things like that it, very simple programs but you know really important for the communities that they serve so so actually i at the time i had been working with a uh, a mechanical engineer named mel bilo great guy and he said i want you to meet my friend joel breitbart who was the head of the department of park Re of recreation and parks at the city of la and I got to meet Joel, who was, was also a very open-minded, uh, interesting man. And he really loved architecture and he followed it in the magazines. He was an architecture buff. And I, and I would always kind of send him articles if I was published typically on a house, right? Mm -hmm. And he gave me the opportunity to do uh, one of those recreation and park buildings. Wow called the the uh, and it's uh it's the chateau recreation center and that's uh, s h a t t o it's it's on fourth street near vermont in mm -hmm. you know kind of near downtown la uh and the building really um it, it it was a breakthrough building for me and i think the design was was breakthrough as well uh i worked with my friend ed moses the painter and we did some very interesting uh integrated art and architectural ideas and uh the project caught the imagination of many and it was in the uh, overdrive exhibit at the getty a mm -hmm. number of years ago wow and it, that project is also going to the getty gosh it's it's really yeah. interesting to hear these kind of um, pivotal projects and moments in your career mm -hmm. um the a quick question regarding the the last project you just mentioned so i assume it's you haven't done a at that point you hadn't done a project like that like uh, that building type um how did you how did you work through it i mean you had done that theater you know abroad but nothing right. local um did you have to collaborate with other architects who had expertise and done this nope. type or you just no nope. you just went for it went for it amazing yeah just hire a good structural engineer. That's important. <laughs> you don't want it to. You don't want it to fall down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a good engineer, a good builder. Then you can design anything, and they will help make sure that <laughs> it gets helps. done right. Yeah. No, I yeah. I had the confidence that I could do it, and, that, and we did. I did. Yeah. That actually reminds me. I, I remember now. Actually, in school, I, I studied one of your. I think it was a library of some kind. Um, yes. I, and, and, and by the way, that so that that's my that was. The, the next sequence of this oh yeah 
of this story is that once you get your first public building, others were easier to get. So I did three public libraries for the city of LA and have subsequently done many public projects. And um, so it, but it's always hard breaking through. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always difficult to get that first project of a different building type. We, we just completed literally not even a year ago, the Pendry hotel and residences, and it's on sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood. And uh, it, it, um, it was our first hotel and wow. we were, you know, again, it took a charismatic, uh, visionary client to hire us even and it, and it worked, it happened. Even for an office like you guys who, you know, you your office has been around, you're established, everyone knows you do yep. really good work, you've been published, everything that you could possibly want nearly is, is there on paper for certain project types, types of buildings. So even with that, it, you found it difficult to break into like doing hotels or doing something else. It, it uh, yeah, P, you know, uh, clients can often be conservative. You know, they want to know sure. how many have you done, how many have you done in the last five years, on and on. It's typical. So yeah, yeah. we have to we have to prove ourselves all the time, <laughs> and to and to go like one rung up the ladder, meaning, you know, oh, a project type that you've never done before. You have to be more convincing, or have someone who already believes in you for other reasons, whatever that is, or have a connection that people feel strongly about. So all those are, yeah, it's. That's architecture. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting because so going back to the uh, the the studio you had done that was photographed by Schulman, um, yes. it seemed like you kind of got there one because you have some uh, personal connections, but basically it was a relationship thing. And it's the same thing with the the, the downtown structure that you were talking about. It was the, basically the a Chateau relationship. Center, yeah, yeah, the Chateau because the it, person liked you. It, yes, well, it, it, he liked me, but it wasn't just. Um, only personality it was liked what i was doing like the work sure, sure. The, that that i was doing and 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 then you notice that i'm using the word i in my early career and then i shift to we <laughs> as time marches on because uh i uh, am we're now a partnership mm -hmm. i am not a sole practitioner which i was for about 30 years and now we're a partnership uh, and you mentioned Takashi; he's one of one of my partners. So, we we take on a whole different scale of work and uh, the ability to do many more projects as well. Did you know when you started your practice that eventually you would want it to be as big as it is today, or you just thought it's just going to be me and my projects like, doing my thing? <laughs> uh, I remember proclaiming in the early eighties that an architectural studio didn't need to be more than three people. And <laughs> five years later, it never needed to be more than eight people. <laughs> and then another five years later, well, 15 seems like a good number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and now we're 45 people. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I had no idea. It just grew organically. I will say though, and this is from, and, and, if the firm grows in size much bigger than we are, it'll those decisions will be made by my partners because uh, I'm not. How do I say it? I'm not managing things at this point, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there is still an intimacy that we have with 40, 45 people yeah. because yeah. you know everybody by their first name, yeah, and you pretty much you know we have our office barbecues now. There has been a a, clearly a slowdown in that with um, mm -hmm. COVID, but, but uh, you know, we know, we know their kids, we know their spouses or, yeah. or significant others. And, and that um, there's something nice about scale. That's, that's a good scale. It's an intimate scale. And plus that many people can do a lot of work. Believe me. Yeah. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I've always had a fascination and the both of us have with, um, team sizes and office structures and things. I don't know why we're fascinated in it. And it does seem to be that 40 to 60 is kind of one one size of an office that seems to be of one space. But when you get up to like 80 and plus, it's a it's a whole different management thing right. you have to control. Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah. And I don't know that we've ever, we've never gone to 60. And even that would be pushing sort of, it. 
Well, I, I don't know because um, <laughs> maybe six is the new eight. I don't want to drive the ship like that. I, too many, too many part, bits and parts. Yeah. 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 So, um, I also want to know what was Julius Schulman like because I had met him one time. Mm -hmm. I saw him lecture at one point, but that was actually was just a few years before he passed away. At that point, um, yes. but he's an iconic figure. He's photographed a he lot is. of Im impressive things. What yes. was he like? Well, he. You know, he changed over time. I mean, I knew him from the age of 70 all the way to the age of 98 and a half when he passed and, and we were friends. Um, he was a kind man, very talented, very opinionated. <laughs> uh, and as he got older, he wanted to be the silverback gorilla in the room. That was his thing. He, <laughs> he wanted to be the center of attention, I really should say. Right. But but uh, an endearing character, incredibly talented, and uh, a sweetheart. Yeah. Were you able to have him photograph other projects of yours? Yes, he he did over the years at least a half a dozen of our projects, and and I might add that uh, as he as he was in his nineties and slowing down a little bit physically, uh, we'd have him come over to have lunch with our entire office and just chat with everybody. And he loved that. He loved, you know, sharing stories and communicating and, and uh, telling stories about his career and all of that. Yeah. Good person. And, and his, by the way, all of his archives are, are at the Getty Center. I, I had once heard from a, another architect who had had a, just a model of I think an urban plan and some towers and some stuff that was photographed by him. And it's funny because for me, you know, Julius Schulman is associated with all of his great photographs, obviously. And you think, why would he come in and photograph a model? But uh, the story goes, at least he came into this space, a really tight, tight space with his big model. And he was very methodical. And it basically took like maybe one, maybe two shots. And that was it. And they were perfect. They were like absolutely yeah. perfect. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, back then there was no digital photography. He right. came in with, with his big four by five camera and, uh, you know, he had to put the black, the black, uh, the hood thing. shield, the right. hood, the hood. And, uh, it was a different, a different, um, era. Yeah. He, he also, I thought was the master of black and white photography. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that you guys have been in Culver city for almost the entire duration of the office, if not the entire duration, right? Well, no, not not the entire duration of the practice because huh. I started 40 years ago, but we've been in this building, my gosh, about 25 years. And um, that's a long time. And it, <laughs> I, actually, there's the office behind me. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it looks like. It's it's a, it's an interesting story. Uh, it, it's it's uh, it was. Well, I'll tell you the story. Uh, so I was always i always had a, a good way of finding inexpensive rent for the first let's say 20 ish years of of my career and <laughs> i would i would find old warehouses practically falling down or places where people said well we'll give you a month to month lease we can't guarantee how long it'll be and then it lasted maybe three years so all that stuff was great but it was time to kind of maybe try to hunker down and find a space and Santa Monica was always too expensive. I could never find anything that excited me. And, um, my realtor, uh, showed me this building, which that didn't look like this when I saw it, it was actually a defunct mortuary oh. and it was all boarded up huh. uh, for about two years. It had just low T bar ceilings, chopped up little rooms and I went into the attic and I saw this magnificent spatial um, experience and or the potential for it and uh, did some research at the library. And it was built in this building was built in 1917 wow. as Culver City's dance hall and clubhouse. Wow. So so cool. so I like to say from life to death to rebirth. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> but, but this has been our office for 20 plus years. And, um, and the last, I'm not exactly sure of the dates, but the last six or seven years, we've been a partnership with Takashi and I, Matthew Cheney and Patricia Ree. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so the firm now is called Ehrlich and I Reed Cheney architects mm -hmm. shortened EYRC.
Gotcha. But you've always been in Southern California, if not mm -hmm. specifically Culver City. And I think what's mm -hmm. interesting about yes. LA, if people don't know, is that I'm sure American architects and architecture students will know this, that there's a rich history of the case study houses and this kind of group in Southern California. I mean, stretching all the, all the way back to Schindler, Neutra, then Eames, and then whoever else, De Koenig, and whoever else is part of the case study in that kind mm -hmm. of scene. I was wondering if you see yourself as being somehow yourself, your work, your office, what you've done, somehow related to that history in some way? Is it, a, is it an inspiration for you? Do you, is that part of your, I don't know, per, your vision in some, some sense? Yeah, I would say that, that California modernism is a guiding, a guidepost mm -hmm. for our work. Uh, I think it's gone in, in, um, in its own direction and it's been synthesized integrated and modified to our vision but definitely those early california modernists all the way up through my dear friend ray cappy i mean the, mm. those works have greatly influenced our work uh and i already mentioned that um that the painting studio photography studio that i did was adjacent to a richard neutra house and i've also done a major extension to a Richard Neutra house on the beach in Santa Monica. Oh, really? And I have uh, bought and renovated two very modest little um, Schindler houses in Inglewood. So uh, I I think I know their work intimately, mm -hmm. and it it's influential. Absolutely. I am familiar with at least one of the Schindler houses you spoke about, um, and if I recall, I remember seeing an image of its previous state state prior to you your interven intervening and it mm -hmm. was very dilapidated from what i could tell it, it was incredibly dilapidated but the good news is it had not been um remodeled over the years and mm. and completely chopped up and changed right. it was just old and tired uh, and uh also it was defunct and boarded up for like a year or two and uh, I bought it. It became actually a, a family project because oh. um, my daughter, Ona, and her husband, Joel, decided that they would love to be part of the project. So we did it together and we completely made it new, which I'll explain further on. What does new mean? And and they, uh, they then bought the house uh, from me, basically. <laughs> and... and uh, and they've been living there for 10 years and they love it. And it's oh, great. Cool. And James, their son is growing up there. But uh, when we did, when we did the, um, the renovation or ad readaptation of the, of the structure, we, first of all, we didn't add any square footage and we answered every question about what to do in a way that we didn't feel we had to be a slave to the architecture mm. we said what would schindler do today not be married to what he did literally in 1940 <laughs> so sure so so we opened up the kitchen to the living space and by the way it's a it's a a, a 1000 square foot house it's very modest mm. but having said that uh it's it's now effectively a brand new house but it's it's uh, schindler's vision but uh refreshed it's very interesting mm -hmm. to think about, like you mentioned the story of your office building, kind of like the different lives that buildings can have. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it's probably something that that we architects don't think often, right? Like we kind of think of the building that we're designing for the moment at which we're designing it, right? We're not necessarily thinking about the very many lives our buildings could have in the future. Yeah. Um, which I don't know. It's kind of a very interesting thing to it, think it, about. It is interesting, and and actually, a big part of our uh, of the projects we do is adaptive reuse. We're right. Really, we're really proud of some of the buildings, and now they tend to be bigger buildings. Mm -hmm. um, often, like right now, under construction, we have we're we're completely re envisioning an old Los Angeles Times printing press plant in in Costa Mesa in Orange County. Oh. And uh, it's huge. It's 500,000 square feet and we're adding new buildings and modifying and taking this basically what was a factory and turning it into 
into workspace uh, with indoor outdoor uh, experiences and light and air and but capturing the industrial nature of literally 50 foot ceilings in some spots <laughs> so it's it i think adaptive reuse has a lot of potential i really do i think it's a way to recycle buildings give them a new life it's a sustainable strategy in that you're not tearing it down and throwing all that material away you're reinvigorating it with a new vision but yeah. keeping the bones so there's there's a nice it's it's very interesting to have a dance between history and and new yeah uh they do that all the time in europe and it, yeah. it, it, it that excites me too yeah I want to ask you about your <clears throat> architectural <laughs> style I, as a word that I don't know what else to use. Uh, but, you know, there's clearly the California modern is, is has a presence there. I mean, in, in California. Um, but you had also mentioned that your experience in Africa is something that highly influenced, you know, how you think, how you work and et cetera. Um, how do you and you guys, I would say that you guys do modern work, right? So, like, how would you describe the the approach or style or aesthetic or however you would call it the, the work that you right, do right uh well first of all i wouldn't call it style because uh, i don't <laughs> think in those terms i always get in trouble with that word, <laughs> yeah, that word, it, word. it's like it's like i wouldn't use the word to describe any of our work as pretty i don't know that's just, that's not allowed <laughs> can't, can't use that word <laughs> but um but anyway um well you know one of the things that we pride ourselves on is that we're yes contemporary modern vision uh but i don't know we don't have a singular way of doing it or it doesn't look we're, we're not we're not creating a brand where we like to approach each project quite empiric empirically mm -hmm. whether it's a house or a office complex or an academic building i mean we want to resolve it from you know an empirical point of view and understand the context the urban context the setting uh, obviously solar and environmental uh, constraints you know you uh, we would never build a building that on all four sides it would look the same because every exposure to the sun is different so mm -hmm. that would make no sense so so i i, I think we're we we like to um be sensitive environmentally and culturally. And, and we've done projects overseas too. We've done a couple of large projects in Dubai and in Taiwan and there, and it actually one in Japan a long time ago. And there I, I'd say we had the, the layer of cultural sensitivity as well. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a style. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. Um, <laughs> Uh, what was my next question? Oh, uh, so I think one of the things that comes up when folks hear the term modern, right, um, as a an approach to architecture or whatever you would call it, is, is how can a modern structure be sensitive to the culture in place when it seems to be following a certain set of, you know, formal principles or, or whatever, right? So, um, but I would also describe your work as, as doing both quite well. Um, so how do you guys find that balance between doing something that is contemporary and is modern, but uh, but is, as you said, responsive to a culture? You know, boy, I'm probably not going to answer that question exactly head on, but I'm going to give you an observation. So sometimes I'll hear some of the younger practitioners in the office, and everybody's younger than me, by the way. So... Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, and I'll hear them say, oh, we don't want to do, uh, we don't want to do anything dated. And I go, I'm thinking to myself, dated, what does that really mean? Because, you know, a building should be there for 50 or 100 years, or maybe be adaptively reused in 75 years. And mm -hmm. w the word, you know, it, it has to stand the test of time it has to be fresh even 25 years later and it can be so um i didn't answer your question but that it, it's that sort of touches on it yeah i get what you're saying there's a there's a little bit of a difference between um the focus being creating something that's more timeless as opposed to something that's timely and just trying to 
It's a perspective right. thing, probably. Right. You know, we're not we're not really concerned about fads of the moment. You know, obviously we're concerned with with current issues. You yeah. know, we want to be. You know, and there's been a greater emphasis by everybody, inc- including state codes for sustainability. We're very, very concerned with that, and uh, always improving how we approach things. Um, and um, you know, technology changes, and we want to be part of that. How we deliver projects with, you know, the fact that you know everything was hand drawn at the early part of my career, and now everything obviously is three-dimensionally drawn in three-dimensional software mm-hmm. and i mean the power of the tools is just phenomenal um we also but we still have a a, a model shop in our studio and it it has all kinds of hand handcraft tools as well as digital tools so we have our you know table saws and drills and cutting boards and all that but you know of course we have 3d printers and plasma cutters and uh cnc machines so i i i think to have to embrace these later technologies for the sake of exploring a design is a terrific thing apart from technologies i was wondering um and this is a broad question we're talking about the profession and practice of architecture at large um you know looking back what has been some of the biggest changes um, in your mind in the profession or the practice of architecture? 15 years ago, or maybe it was more, um, we actually had an opportunity to enter into a competition for what's called design build. And you probably are familiar with that, Mm -hmm. but that's where the architect and the contractor team up and universities are embracing that quite a bit and our first design build project was the walter cronkite school of of uh, journalism and mass communication in downtown phoenix Hmm. uh, for arizona state university and it was all new to us Uh, back in those days the aia would say oh design build that's a bad (laughs) thing you know and we didn't know it was bad and it turned out to be um a very, very uh, good vehicle for delivering value to the clients and great design. We never let it, we always looked at ourselves as partners uh, mm-hmm. with, with with both the owner and the contractor and we still delivered really good buildings. So we've done we've done a lot of successful and, and uh, projects that we're proud of. We did a United States federal courthouse in Yuma, Arizona, the John M. Roll federal courthouse. And that was design build the Walter Cronkite school. I already mentioned uh, right now under construction, we have a large, very large um, student housing project in at UC San Diego. So I think, you know, we have to be, open to uh, delivery trends and Mm -hmm. potential Mm -hmm. that's interesting design build is something that we've talked about a few times and it's it's something that i think more and more architects are um being open to 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 doing um but i've always thought of it as a as if you're a design build office then you and you're an architect who's leading the office let's say that you have your contractor and team in-house but in these cases that you're describing they're they're not part of eyrc right so is it just that you're doing like a joint venture and so contractually you're both 50 50 you know responsible for everything is that well the contractual thing you know the contractor tends to have much more responsibility and a bigger chunk of of you know to build something is tenfold what it costs to design something um but uh, but there's a partnership of understanding and that we're in this together. We're all on the same boat and let's do a great job. Well, so I guess the question is like, what's the difference between design build? If we're talking about design build where there's a distinct architecture office that's separate and a contractor that's separate, what makes a design build as opposed to a typical, uh, a typical way of working with everyone just getting along better? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Okay. So, I mean, I'll, I'll just try to summarize very briefly. Um, so the traditional design bid build is where, you know, the architect and the owner 
work together. Something's designed by the architect. It goes out to bid and then it's built. Whereas uh, design build means that the contractor and the architect and the owner are kind of three legs in a stool, mm -hmm. takes three legs to hold it up and um, work together to get the best value in every way, both in delivery of what they need programmatically, but also quality of building and quality of design excellence and all of that. It's all paramount, but it's not like you design something in a bubble right. and then the bid comes in <laughs> twice as much and everybody yeah. is like really pissed off. And I mean, <laughs> we've all seen this happen. So it's just more of a team working it out at the beginning. Right. Right. And getting the most that a team can deliver rather than three separate buckets that yeah. can end up also very well, but maybe with more unknowns. Yeah. Yeah, sure. That makes a lot of sense with everyone siloed. And and by the way, we still do many, many projects. Uh, you know, we design them, we, and then they're built. We, you know, we find a qualified contractor and then it's built. Most of our houses are, are done that way. We don't do design build houses. It's really for public structure. It, it's, it's a delivery method that universities are really embracing. And you guys have had a very positive experience with that, right? We have, we have, uh, you know, I, I've heard some architects grumble that, oh, you can't get a good design that way, but it's not true. It's not true. You can. Well, it's, it's, it's the peculiar thing to me is that most of the architects and con most of the people we speak with who, clients, architects, contractors, when we talk about design and build, they often have pretty positive things to say about it. And what's interesting is that the AIA historically, maybe they're changing their tone now. I don't know, actually, but they've always been pretty much against it, right? They, they were, but I think, I, you know, I don't follow where their stand is right yeah. now, but definitely they were against it <laughs> back a few decades ago. Uh, I, I, I think it's a trend that they can't be against. It's reality. It doesn't yeah. matter what, if, if they're against it, they're just, <laughs> you know, they're <laughs> screaming into the wind. Who cares? You know? Have you guys ever considered um, for, you know, your residential uh, projects in the office to have design build within EYRC, like to have contractors? Yeah. Good question. We, you know, we have that from time to time, we'll bring that debate into, uh, into our, conversations uh, and we've concluded we don't want to do that it's hmm. it's a, it's possible it's a whole nother business it's it, it some firms do it some some firms are real design build where they design it and they build it mm -hmm. and uh it's impressive that they do it but it, it we, we just want to focus on what we can do well and team up with contractors who do what they do well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would imagine also, especially at this point, you guys have your, I would assume, pretty good list of great contractors you've worked with in the past. You probably work with them, you know, on multiple things. And, you know, even if contractually it's not design build and whatnot, you, you're working so closely, you know them so well that it's effectively like design plus build or whatever you would call it, you know. Right. That's a good point. Yes. Yeah. And that is true. Yeah. We, we have now worked with really a, a, a good a good variety of different contractors at different scale projects and yes we we those relationships are important so you guys have done quite a bit of um, different types of projects is there any type that you haven't done yet that you're kind of <laughs> like oh, you know what you'll be cool to do that <laughs> oh I was hoping you'd ask me that question <laughs> uh, we have done a lot of different projects project types. And in fact, the way I like to say it, it's from house to warehouse <laughs> to courthouse to house of parliament. We've actually done all of them. Wow. But, but having said that, uh, I am personally interested in two spectrums of project types. And one is actually, I would love to do, and I'm trying to find the right word, but I would maybe call it a spiritual space hmm. building type. 
it could be it could be a church a synagogue a mosque it could be uh some sort of space to view art um it could be a contemplative center but that would be of great interest to me mm -hmm. where the focus is on contemplation and slowing down and observing mm -hmm. um and then i also have kind of a desire to work on very community-minded issues um low-cost housing uh and community-based dis uh, for disadvantaged communities that that interests me as well i can certainly understand the interest in um community oriented community focused uh, structures why the interest in the spiritual uh type of architecture uh just because it can be so pure potentially it could be so pure and beautiful and hmm. and explore light and space materials experience mm -hmm. just enter into the world of not having to meet lots of little criteria of <laughs> we need one of these and three of those and four of those yeah, program yeah just you know a place to be that would be mm. special mm -hmm. and i think we come close to achieving that in some of our houses but yeah. this would be singularly specific for what i just described i was thinking like you 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 bought houses before that you kind of like renovated and and you know like kind of brought back to life in a way would you be interested in doing things where you would develop your own project and maybe develop this own contemplation center of yours, <laughs> oh, like, you know? <laughs> uh, if I was wealthy enough, I, was, I would do it. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I don't really want to be a developer per se, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, yes, I, I mean, I designed and built the house that my wife and I still live in for 16 years now. Uh, and this office building is something a bit, a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. But um, again, I, I, I just never wanted to dilute myself so much, mm -hmm. um, but I would love to, I mean, what would it be? Maybe it would be an art gallery or, yeah, maybe that's a good idea. I'll think about that. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I'll always attribute that to you. <laughs> <If it happens. laughs> um, I, I did want to talk about your own home. Are you, or the one that you're in currently, is that still, I forget the number, but it's on Palms Se or Palms? 700 Palms Boulevard, yes, in Venice. Yeah. And uh, it, you know, it's on a 5,700-foot lot. Uh, it actually in many ways it kind of brings in a lot of the ideas that i had observed and thought about over the arc of my career including hmm. the six years that i lived in africa it's a courtyard house um you know when i first went to morocco and i lived in a in a little courtyard house and i re and, and i didn't have any view except four walls of a little courtyard <laughs> i mean that was a little uh, that took some adjusting to get used <laughs> to that and and then i became enamored uh, with the wisdom of a courtyard because it could be your own sacred garden and your quietly contemplative space uh so anyway getting back to my house at 700 palms in venice it's it's an urban oasis it 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 opens out to trees and water and uh garden uh we have huge doors that i like to use the word disappear they slide into pockets in a wall and go away or mm -hmm. huge doors that pivot open so the door the, sorry the project or, or the house can transform itself to a a spacious cozy environment on a cold night or on a beautiful day for which we have so many uh you can make the dat the glass disappear and it opens into this indoor outdoor living experience so um we still love living there is it yeah. is it weird to live in your own creation like are you looking at it all the time like oh i could have done something different here or like this was great detail you know like <laughs> uh you know i we still like living there that's that's a good thing. <laughs> that's good that's a good thing and and we like and people like to come and gather with us whether it's 
uh, friends, family. We have three grown daughters, a grandkid. Um, but, and, and we'll, you know, we'll have friends over. We'll, we'll even, we have certain nonprofits that we support and we'll, we will host, uh, gatherings for fundraising purposes for those nonprofits, that kind of thing. Um, what, what would I do differently? Um, I mean, there's a lot of richness of material. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the ground level floor is, um, is dark chocolate brown. So there's a little bit of a story here. So I, when the concrete was wet, the day of the pour, and mm -hmm. they're polishing it, we took iron oxide and threw the iron oxide into the, dusted it on the entire surface, and it turned this beautiful chocolate brown color. Hmm. And just the other day, I was thinking, hmm, I wonder if I should have just let it be gray concrete. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I never... And I still love it being chocolate brown. But if it was gray concrete, then our cats, which are chocolate brown, wouldn't match the floor. So <laughs> there you have it. Have so to right change now cats. <laughs> yeah, no, we can't change cats. We're, we're <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we have actually these chocolate brown cats that match the floor and it's a little ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I do have a slight confession, and that is I've actually been to your home now that I'm, I'm remembering it. I, I studied it in school, and I've actually been there. Oh, cool. And I think I was a student, and I think it was during one of the events that you described, a non -pro or something was happening. Like maybe a tour or something. It's been on architecture tours. Yeah. And tours. I don't mm -hmm. I don't honestly, the night was pretty hazy, uh, being college students <laughs> with a bunch of friends. I won't, but... I, won't, I won't ask any questions about that. <laughs> But uh, it's a really, really, really cool house. Um, and yeah, I remember you had these uh, uh, primary color, like I think they're orange and red, um, uh, what do you call it? Like roll down shades uh, things that are on the yes. exoskeleton sort yes, of? Yes, on, on the exoskeleton, that is correct. Big shades that block the sun. The house doesn't have any air conditioning because oh, really? it it's by the coast and we, we capture natural breezes. I mean, we're lucky to live in a you know cooler climate, obviously, but... Uh, yeah, it's a very living, breathing, environmental house. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. leaping from that to design process, um, I know you guys, you had said that you, you know, every project is kind of different, but there, there must be key questions that are, you know, consistent between, be, excuse me, between projects that um, are always important to you guys or to you specifically, let's say. You know, so, so much of uh, a project's design is having a vision. Mm -hmm. the, you know, what is the big vision or the big idea or in architectural parlance, the party? Uh, and, and also solving the problem of, with all the constraints. I mean, there's so many constraints and the constraints are code related like the setbacks and the height and and then there's the the program and the, i mean I'm, I'm not talking very generally from like a house to uh student housing for 2000 students i mean there's a big there's a big difference but i still think that there is uh and and we do a lot of analysis now much more than we used to about um environmental impact what is what is it and how can we resolve it and integrate it but they're you know bringing it all together there's still ultimately i think uh a there's some hopefully there's something magical that can be discovered that brings it all together um which is that guiding light that answers many other further detailed questions down the mm -hmm. road. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I mean, some offices I feel like are very aware of what you just said and they they know that when they're embarking on a project, when they're designing a project, if they don't have a, a some sense of what that thing is, call it a concept, call it a guiding light, mm -hmm. call it a vision, whatever, mm -hmm. that they end up in, in scenarios where they're struggling. And other offices seem to practice and they have no, they don't really care about that. It's more about just solving like one thing at a time. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's interesting that, I mean, personally for me, I can't imagine trying to design something without a larger 
storyline, vision, whatever you would again describe mm -hmm. it as, mm -hmm. I think it would be difficult. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think you're right. <laughs> it would be. <laughs> So yep. uh, what are some of the current things you're working on now? Um, well, we well, first of all, uh, my three partners whose names I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, they all actually have um, areas of great interest that they pursue and and uh, and go on <laughs> with. But uh, the projects right now, um, well, r the recent projects that I'm quite proud of, is this new Pendry hotel and uh, residences. And it's a big team, it took a big team to make that happen. But I was very much part of the initial organizing principles of the design. And um, under construction, this I mentioned the large UC San Diego project, which I was very fundamentally involved in the early stages. And it's a huge team carrying it through as well. And I'm working on uh, two houses right now that I'm very personally uh, engaged in. So that's that's my personal interest, but I, I take great pride and interest in being part of the whole atelier. And, you know, we have weekly meetings with partners and the uh, leadership group in our office and all of that. And I, frankly, I can't wait till we all reoccupy <laughs> this space. It's been kind of a, Kind of weird. Very crazy, very crazy time. Although I have to say that that you know, the world has changed, and you know, just like we're doing now remotely, um, it if we integrate both the <laughs> the 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 remote digital way of communicating, and then get back to some of these just tangible people together moments, I, I think it'll will be good. It'll. It's where we have to end up. We shouldn't just go into the world of digital communication. Yeah. Oh no, I, I really, no, I, I, really hope, I hope not. <laughs> I mean, there's been benefits no, yeah. like for sure, but uh, not not that only would, that. That would, that would be rough. <laughs> that would be rough stuff. Um, yeah. So you know, I mean, I'm you know, I I'm at the later phases of my career. Still love architecture. Uh, very happy with knowing that the work I've done and let's call it the legacy is, is, um, is going to be captured not only in the buildings and, and, and what they are and who they serve, but I mentioned uh, my anthropological and early six years in Africa going to the Getty and my California work is going to the museum at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So all that feels really good and i still love being an architect and i'm really proud of being able to work with this great group of younger people that are so talented so yeah i'm pretty much a happy camper <laughs> it's well well deserved <laughs> for sure I, I was wondering uh so how long ago did the office kind of restructure to becoming eyrc as opposed to just the e right well we it seems like we started the official partnership in um, right around 2014, I think it was. Okay. And 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 then it was called Ehrlich Architects. And actually, we we won the National AIA Firm Award in 2015, and it was at that time called Ehrlich Architects, but it really was a partnership then. And then, like a year later. Uh, or thereabouts, uh, it it we changed it to Ehrlich and I Cheney, and um, and it's been that way for at least a half a dozen years, ish, five years in that name. Mm -hmm. And so, what was the reason for the change? Uh, well, you know, my partner said they wanted to have their name on the door, and I thought about it. I go, yeah, you're right. They should be on the door. <laughs> okay. Simple as that, you know. Uh, I think that uh, for any architect who's um, contemplating, you know, transitioning from a sole proprietor to a partnership, and maybe that legacy continues after you're no longer involved, uh, I think you have to empower people. You have to give them a voice. They have to be. Uh, they have to get known in the, um, you know in the world of design and the marketplace as 
as leaders with their own personalities and and that's what we have did that change mm-hmm. anything in um you know the way how uh, your clients perceive the office or the types of clients that you've been getting since hmm. yeah I, well you know all of the all, all of my partners are able to bring in work and they have their they have actually distinct client relationships and project types that they're really strong in so yeah they i mean the ability you know that's the, the key for every architectural practice is can you continue to be an architect and the only way you can continue to be an architect is is to have new work yeah. to to work on to design and so um that gene exists in all of us and that's a that's a great thing very healthy that's very cool um mm-hmm. A, b- a bit of a pivot, uh, talking about the building industry and 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 just designing and building buildings. Mm-hmm. Um, we've heard from a couple different architects um, who are older that it's much more difficult now to create architecture than it was X amount of time ago. Which well, kind of sucks for cre- us to, cre- to hear that. Do you mean to create a practice? Or no, sorry, sure. to create a building, right? To design oh. and then construct a building. Um, I think well, so specifically like we interviewed an architect up in San Francisco, Stanley mm-hmm. Sadowitz, you probably mm. know this. Yeah. Stanley. I know Stanley. Yep. Yeah. And he's he very was, talented. I like him. Yeah. yeah. Very talented. Very interesting person. Also has yep. some roots. Well, not, not some, he was, I think born in Africa, right? Or yeah, South, Africa. South Africa. South Africa. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, he was remarking that it's like way more difficult to get stuff constructed today. And that in fact, he, I think he actually said that some of the buildings are doing now are the let like lesser quality, but like three times the cost. And so anyway, mm. um, I was wondering if on to get your take, if, if you think it's much more difficult to to do what we do today, if it is difficult and why? I, in general, I think it is true. Um, I think that there are many more forces uh, that are influencing a project. Mm-hmm. So for example, uh, in Venice, let's say you want to do a, a house in Venice or a house in the coastal zone along <laughs> the coast. I mean, the hoops that we have to jump through are so tedious and there will be neighborhood opposition for no reason at all, because it's all within the height limits and setbacks. But there's a lot of, just a lot of opposition that's out there Um which is not well founded, frankly, mm. and and that makes it more difficult. Codes are tend to be more stringent and complicated, but that's just something we have to deal with. So we accept that as part of the the, the given. Um, in terms of construction, no, I think I think there's still great quality construction going on. Um, will it cost more? Probably more than it has to have cost. It will absolutely cost more than it did 10, 20 years ago because prices rise. Um, but, so what was, what was Stanley's main point? That <laughs> he's not getting the quality of the building or I'm not clear? I don't want to misquote him. I think it was everything. Mm-hmm. I think it was a, a combination of the building codes becoming ever more complicated, uh, certainly resistance, especially the projects he does, you know, does really modern right. structures. Right, and right. Like, you know, the heart of San Francisco, not easy to do. Yeah. And also the cost of construction. It's particularly yeah. right now, obviously, is uh, I'm, I'm glad he's being the lovable curmudgeon that he is. And, <laughs> and He's 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 channeling uh, really uh, things that some architects just don't want to say. So yeah. mm. bravo for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so opening up the question a bit more, then, um, what do you think is the the biggest challenge of of uh, for architects today? You know, in, in designing and creating buildings. I think okay. Right now, I mean, this is like right now we are we thought we were at the tail end of a pandemic and now we found out that we're really not at the end of it yet. Right. So I think the world has changed really. And therefore architecture is in the process of trying to discover how does it respond to these changes? The workplace may be 50% working remotely and 15, 50% in place. It's not known yet. Mm-hmm. I, I don't. I, I think that we're in a state of flux that hasn't been fully 
um, resolved. Having said that, I think that there is that as architects and certainly what we want to do is we want to be aware of the counterpoint to some of the issues, global issues. Hmm. Um, what are those global issues? Of course, we mentioned pandemic. Climate change is so huge. I mean, I feel for my grandson. I really do. Uh, but what can we do to help create spaces for wellness and peacefulness and ultimately the pursuit of happiness, you know? And and I think we have to, hopefully we won't lose sight of those issues and we have to be adaptable, flexible, and creative to find the solution. So I think we're, I think we're at a time of change, great change. And uh, hopefully we will be open-minded. That's great. Mm. Do you have a favorite building? <laughs> <laughs> it's a mm. question that we should ask more often because it's always... Uh, yeah, I hate of... that question because <laughs> I have too many favorites. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. It can't wow. be your own home. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I would, I would, I, I won't, I'm smart enough to know. I'm, I am wise enough not to mention my own uh, stuff. Uh, uh, <sighs> Oh, it could be a building that that moves you a lot, not that necessarily, really you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, maybe I will name a few. Okay. So the buildings that just pop in my mind that move me, the Kimball Art Museum in De oh. in Fort Fort Worth mm -hmm. by Lewis Kahn. I've never been. That's on the it's on the, oh, the yeah. list. You have to go, you have to go. The, the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul will blow your mind. Um, in fact, <laughs> I've only seen it in photographs, but I, in about two weeks, I will be going to the Villa Savoie and have oh. just great expectations for that. I've never you been, know, so let me know how it well, is. You've never uh, been. I, I've never I been. will. I'll be what sure are to, you... go, to tell you. You're from France. How have you never been there? So what? It took me 10 years to go to the Eiffel Tower. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the Ville, Ville Savoie you is really go. interesting. You should go. <laughs> I, actually, I, I, I want to see the Maison de Verre, but, oh, yeah. mm. but I don't think um, I've been writing to them. They say, oh, no, I have to sign up six months in advance. Yeah, they're a little bit snobby. But I'm gonna, I may try just to show up and see if there's yeah. an opening. You know, that's, that's one thing in... Uh, in architecture, you can't take no for an answer. <laughs> One of the things that we'll say to our younger practitioners when they head off to the building department is, don't come home without it. <laughs> need, get that stamp on the plans. <laughs> Figure it out. Whatever you have to do to get it. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Uh, on verra, right? <laughs> yeah. Ville Savoie is an interesting place. I've, I've been there and... Um, uh, Obviously, the first images that come to mind when anyone thinks of it is the exterior. Yeah. And if you're an architect, they're probably the floor plans and the interior as well. But it is the interior is jam packed with a lot of different spaces and a lot of different things going on. That's mm. not the immediate thing you think of as a let's say just a tourist, right? I mm. I'll be cur be curious to see what you think of it because yeah, it's, no, I'm, it's I'm very, very much dense. looking. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, but uh, again, I do. I am greatly attracted to very powerful, simple architectural expressions. Mm. Um, the mosque in Cordoba is unbelievable. Um, you know, yeah, I've always appreciated religious spaces, mm -hmm. uh, cathedrals. Mm -hmm. have, yeah. you, have you been to uh, Ronchamp? No, and I want well, to go. You should go I have, there. I haven't been. How far away is that from Paris, the center of Paris? It's not super it close. Like, what, it's like three, a four and a half. Three, four hours? Yeah, like a yeah. four oh, hour yeah. drive. I won't yeah. have time. That's too bad. Um, yeah. Well, it, it's, it is, it's a it. remarkable. Yeah, it is pretty interesting. It's challenging because it takes so long, so long to get there. There's nothing else in the town that I know of, at least. And so, you know, four hours to get there. And the, I've seen it twice now. <laughs> Spoiled. Mm -hmm. The first time I saw yeah. it, and we were there for like two hours. And mm -hmm. I realized nah, this is way too short. You have to be here for like a full day. Yeah, to, yeah, to you have to really absorb it. But but you know, uh, it's just this little conversation we're having makes me think of. I have really always been 
uh, willing to go the extra mile mm -hmm. to go and see something and mm -hmm. to be inspired by something. Like when I was traveling in West Africa and in, in Mali, I, I, on a certain level, you could say, oh, I suffered through long, long, hot, dirt, dusty rides to get somewhere and mosquitoes, you know, just swarming and whatever it is. But when I got to these special architectural jewels along the banks of the Niger River uh, or visited the Dogon tribe and their beautiful architecture, I mean, they become sources of inspiration. So, um, yeah, going to see the Villa Savoie, that's like, I'm going to go the extra mile and uh, see it. And I, I know I will be rewarded for that. Oh, yes, I'm sure. I'm sure it's going to be yeah. awesome. Um, what is the uh, Kimball Art Museum like? It, it's it's sublime. It's it's so pure. It's so simple. Um, it It's a beautiful space. You just want to be there. Yeah. Louis Kahn was so freaking good. <laughs> he was so amazing. Good. And he was, he was a poet, you know, he yeah. was a, a, a yeah. poet in architecture. Yeah. 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 He, he did very few buildings. Amazing. But what yeah. he did was all, all significant and important. Yeah. Uh, my one last question to you is sure. if you, if you, if you could give your younger self an advice, <laughs> what would it be? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I think things turned out pretty well. So play. Yeah, I'm I not know. Complaining. I'm not really complaining. You know, uh, I have, as you have noticed, I have a few expressions and, and, uh, you know, one of them is life gives us what we have to learn. And uh, so that's the path that I've been following. And I don't know what advice I would give myself because Just I'm on go it. With it. So yeah. I'm going with it. Maybe yeah. the concrete flooring. Maybe don't sprinkle that, brown. that, that, that yeah. dust. No, I don't regret it. I do not regret it one bit, actually. Yeah. yeah, my wife says, oh, we need more color in the house. I go, sure. Artwork supplies color. Fabrics can supply color. Yeah. Let the natural materials be what they are. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great response. I will use that the next time I'm in a meeting. <laughs> uh, Stephen, this has been great. I'm so glad we had you on the show. It was fun chatting with you. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it, and I enjoyed it as well. And... Uh, I hope your listeners uh, will appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode. Shout out to Stephen for joining us. It was a pleasure having him on the show. And once again, Comptown Baby, you are the winner <laughs> by default, sort of, of the um, the giveaway book. So uh, write to us and we'll get that going. Um, listeners, thank you for supporting our show uh, by leaving reviews. You can also support our show by, I don't know what, Subscribing, subscribing on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube even. Mm -hmm. You can follow us on all the social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We also have a hotline where you can send a text message, give us some feedback, some guest suggestions, reaction to a topic we've talked about. The number is 213-222-6950. Yep. And what else? That's it. That's a lot of stuff already, so I think, I think that might be it. That's it. Well, stay tuned for the next episode coming out next All week. All right. Yeah, we got some good people lined up as usual, right? Like what is what me? is not the case? <laughs> like you again? Like me I again? Don't <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Do you think you could be a guest again? Yeah. No. What was it? My name was Narima. To 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 do Don't reveal behind the curtain there. But thank you guys for listening and supporting us, and we will continue. Onward and upward. Thanks. All Talk right. to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.